Hey everybody, welcome back. In today's video, we're going to look at quadratic equations again. This time, we're looking specifically at quadratic equations in the form of f of x or y equals ax squared plus c. Uh, in my most previous video, we focused on the a part of this equation and what the letter a does, <clears throat> excuse me, depending on what type of number it is that affects the shape of your parabola. Today we're going to look at the letter C. But just as a quick refresher, in case you didn't have a chance to check out my last video, uh, the most basic, this is called the parent <clears throat> function, the one that we're going to compare everything to, is whenever the letter A is 1. And I have it right over here. I made a little input-output x and y table. I picked the easiest numbers I could think of, negative 2, negative 1, 0, and 1. I plugged them in there for x squared. Negative 2 squared is 4 times 1. Negative 1 squared times 1 is 1. 0 squared times 1 is 0, and so on and so forth. I filled out my little chart. I graphed the points, and this is the basic, most easiest, most easy. It is the quote-unquote parent function, the one that we're going to compare everything to. And what we did in our video last time is we saw how whenever you manipulate, whenever you change this letter A to a number besides 1, that changes how wide open or narrow it changes the width of your parabola, right? When the letter A was a number bigger than 1, right, a number like 2x squared, 4x squared, 7x squared, that would have been, that would be really tough to graph. Anything like that, your number is bigger than 1, your letter A is bigger than 1, that's going to make this graph more compact. It's going to bring these outside edges closer together, right? And something like 7x squared would be very, very close together. I mean, it would be almost straight up and down, right? And so when the letter A was bigger than 1, it made the graph more narrow, and that's what we called a vertical stretch. Um, it's called a vertical stretch, and that was in our most recent video. Whenever the letter A is less than 1, for example, if you had uh, a number between 0 and 1, like 1 third x squared, 1 half x squared, 2 fifths x squared, something like that, you have a fractional amount, or it could be a decimal, right? It could be 0.75x squared. You have a fraction or a decimal that's between 0 and 1. This is going to make your graph more wide. It's going to take these two sides and open it up even wider, kind of like my fingers are making right here, right? And so depending on the number, it's going to open it up wider or uh, whatever the case may be. And this is called a vertical shrink because we're going to shrink that coefficient down to a number that's less than 1. And so when the number was bigger than 1, it brings it closer together and makes it more narrow. When the number is in between 0 and 1, it opens it up and makes it wider. If this was a negative number, it would take the whole thing and flip it upside down and make it a reflection of the original one. All right? That's a quick 2-3 minute overview of what we did the other day. So. Long story short, whenever you change the letter A, you're changing the width or the narrowness of the graph, right? You're going to mess with how close together these sides are. Open it up or push it in together. Today, we're focusing on... I Sorry, I keep hitting my camera. Today, we're going to focus on the letter C. The letter C, just like earlier in the year or in seventh grade when you learn to graph this, right, mx plus b, just like then whenever that number at the end is always your y-intercept, it's kind of the same thing with these. This letter c is going to move the graph up and down on the y-axis, right? So the letter a that we did the other day changes the width of it, pushes it in closer together, or makes it wider. Whenever today we add this plus C, or it could be a minus, it doesn't always have to be a plus. Today, whenever we add a plus or minus part at the end, that's going to move this entire thing up or down on the y-axis. This is a slide, a translation. We're just going to slide it up or slide it down. It's not going to have the vertex on the origin anymore. Right? So let's just say, for example, we take the normal one. 
Um, we take our regular one like this, and we just put the one on there. If I did plus three, right, that's just gonna move all these points. You can see maybe here I've got points, these locations. It's gonna move all these points up three places. We're just gonna shift this entire graph up three places. One, two, three. This one's gonna go up one, two, three. This one, one, two, three. I'm off my graph, I'm gonna freehand. Uh, here, one, two, three. One, two, three, freehanding it again. And you can see this graph is the same width. We're not changing the width. Whenever we add this part at the end, this part at the end changes the y-intercept, right? It changes up or down. You're either going to push it up or you're push it down. If this was a minus 3, we'd move it down three places and we'd have the exact same thing. If this was a 2, plus 2, we'd go up two units. Or if this is a minus 5, we'd go down 5 units. Right? So that's what we're going to look at today. I've got a couple of other boards here I want to go over. I'm going to try not to spend too much time graphing them because I know that is a little time consuming. So what I have on these following boards is just asking you to compare. Right? Compare these three to the parent one. Right? Here's the parent one. f of x, or just y, if that confuses you, just call that the letter y y equals 1x squared. And that's the graph that I had a minute ago with the points um, just like this. It's, it's the same exact input-output table uh, that I had on the other board. So there's the original one. What we're going to look at is how this compares to these. Right? Now, don't get thrown off. On this very first one, you can see on the original one, I have the letter F. On this one, I have the letter G. This one has the letter K. This one has the letter H. Don't let that bother you. They just put different letters there to show you that it's a different graph. That's not anything that you have to calculate. These letters honestly don't mean anything. They're just all different to show you that they're all different graphs. So you're not going to get worried about the lettering. What you should be paying attention to is these parts right here. Right? You notice all of these have a plus or minus part at the end. In the original one, there is no adding or subtracting in this entire equation. There's no adding and subtracting. To be honest, it's plus zero, and that's why it started at the origin. Right? We don't ever put plus zero, but that's basically what we understand to be there. So how are these going to change compared to the original one? Okay, the coefficient, the letter A, right? My letter A is 1. My letter A here is 1. And here is 1. This one's negative 1. We'll get to that one in a minute. But here, the letter A's are still 1, just like this one is. So we haven't messed with the letter A. The only thing we've changed is now we've put the letter C. Now we have a plus or minus part, right? So this is going to be... This is how I've seen it on like a standardized test. They'll say it shifted up two units, right? Plus two. Instead of having a vertex at the origin, we're going to have a vertex right here. And then all these other spots are going to just get moved up two places, this dot, up two places, this spot, up two places. And this graph would have the same width. It has the same, whoops, sorry, can't connect that very well. It has the same width. It has the same axis of symmetry. It has the same uh, domain. It has a different range because it, do, it does, this one would be zero and above. This one is at two and above. Uh, the vertex is different, right? So a lot of it is the same, but it is shifted up two units. Or if you want to sound a little bit more technical, you could call this a vertical translation or a slide, right? Um, if you want to sound really fancy, you say that but it's still up two units, right? You shifted it up two units, or it's a vertical translation, a vertical slide. The second one, very, very similar, right? It's still 1x squared, just like this one is 1x squared. So that part is the same, but this one has minus 5 at the end. This one didn't have anything. So this is not going to be shifted up. You see how when this one has a plus sign, we moved it up. This has a minus sign. So on this one, we're going to go down five units. So instead of having it here at the origin, this one's going to have a vertex way down here, one, two, three, four, five. And then it's going to look something, this one's going to, this point's also going to go down five, one, two, three, four, five. It's going to have one right next to it. And then these points that were way up here on four, it's really hard to tell, but they were right here on four. 
they should be on negative one if I can kind of freehand this, if you don't mind. So here we have another one. It has the same width. It has the same axis of symmetry. The line cutting right there at the y-axis is the same line of symmetry. It has the same domain. It's still all real numbers. It still goes forever and ever to the right and goes forever and ever to the left. It has a different range. The range on this one is now from negative 5 and above. Um, and the vertex has changed. We've just moved the vertex down five units. So this we could also say is a, a vertical translation. I'm going to abbreviate down five units. Okay, and then I have one more. What I've done on letter H here is I've actually done two things to this graph, right? Now, most of you can see, because I put a big box around it, that this has minus one. So it is going to be shifted. This is going to be shifted down one. Down one unit. We're going to move it down one. So it's, instead of being like right here, it's going to be right here. And then all the other points are going to fall in line. However, hold up. This doesn't have one at the beginning. You can see this has a negative one right here. See how you got this negative sign? So negative at the beginning doesn't mean it opens up. Negative means it opens down. So this one's going to go something like this, right? So it's not only shifted down one unit, it's also been flipped, or the fancy word is a reflection, right? Reflected over the x-axis. So sometimes they'll try to trick you. Because not only will they move it up or down, but then they may put a negative on there. If they put a negative on there, instead of having it go up and up and up forever, now it's flipped and it's going down, down, down forever and ever and ever. So, really quickly, hopefully that made sense. Here we moved it up two places. Here we moved it down five places. Here we moved it down one. And we flipped it over the x-axis. We did a reflection. Okay. Let's try a couple more. This is honestly the hardest board right here. This is about as tough as it gets. Uh, I'm not going to graph these. We're just going to use the equations to tell because you really don't need the, uh, the graphs to figure these out. We're going to compare these four to the original one. Notice, here's the original one. It's just f of x equals 1 x squared. So on this one, the letter a is 1. The basic one is always going to look like that. And now look at what we've done on letter g. We've done two things. I can see this right here at the end tells me that we've gone and we've moved it uh, down two units. Down because it was negative, right? We shifted it down two, or we could call this a uh, vertical translation down two. But that's only one of the things that we did, right? Not only did we do that, we've also changed the letter A. You can see here the letter A is 1. On this one, the letter A is 1 half. And so this in orange, this tells you that now we've not only moved it down, we've also messed with how wide or how narrow it is. And do you remember from the very first board, when this is a number less than 1, what does that do to the graph? This opens it up and it makes it wider. And so this is, um, this is a wider graph. Uh, the fancy word we should use by a factor of one-half is how they phrase it in our textbook. The word wider is really not the fancy word. We should, usually, we should say a vertical, vertical shrink because we've taken that number and it's shrunk. It was at 1, and now we're down to 1 half. We've took that coefficient, that letter A, and we shrunk it down from amount of 1 down to 1 half. This is a vertical shrink by a factor of 1 half. So we did two things on this graph. So not only would this graph, like here's the original one, let's just say, I'll put the original one on there on bl in black. I'm just going to freehand it. So if we freehanded the first one, there's the original one. That would be this guy up here. And now this new one, I'm going to do in orange, no, and I'll do it in red so it can stand out from the orange. We're going to move it down too, so it's going to start like down here, and it's also going to be more wide open, right? Because it's only it's got one half at the beginning instead of having one at the beginning, all right? So it's going to be more wide open, and it's going to be moved down two places. Okay, I told 
You guys, I wasn't going to graph them. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, on the next one, it says Q of X. Don't let it bother you that this is a Q. What we're looking at and what I'm concerned at, concerned with are the numbers right there, minus 1. That means we've moved it down 1 unit or a vertical translation down 1. Right? We moved it down 1 because it was negative. That's why I said down. But we've also done something else. If you look here, my letter A is now 3. The fact that my letter A is 3 means this is more narrow, right? Uh, the fancy word we should use is a vertical stretch. We've made this vertical stretch by a factor of 3, right? So if the original one looks like this, I'm going to freehand it again. The second one, you moved it down one, but then it's also more narrow. It might look something like this. See how it's much more close together? Those, those two black lines are much tighter together than the blue ones are. The distance between the black lines is much narrower than the distance between the blue lines. Okay, we've got two more. And then if you can get these, I feel like we're going to be in good shape. On this one, the first thing I notice at the end, they have plus four. So this is going to move it up four units. Uh, vertical translation, I'm not going to write it again, but vertical translation up four. And then at the end, we've got negative one-third. Oh, boy. So I've done two things, actually. Negative one-third. Negative one-third means uh, we flipped it, right? We did a reflection. So now this thing opens down instead of opening up. It's a reflection over the x-axis. The fact that there's a negative sign, that's what the negative sign tells me. The negative tells me it's a reflection. Then the one-third, think about that, one-third is a number between zero and one. When it's a number between zero and one, a fractional amount, it's going to be wider, right? Or the word we should could use is vertical shrink, right? Vertical shrink. This is going to be wider by a factor of one-third. You don't have to put the negative on there because the negative is already taken care of in the re, in the reflection part. So like the original one, if I do the original one in black, I'm just going to freehand it. Maybe the original one looks like this. This one, the new one that we did, it's going to be moved up four. It's going to go up four, but then it's going to open down and it's going to be wider. It's going to be something like this, right? It's going to move up four. It's going to be flipped and it's going to be wider. So actually three things happen to that, right? Boom, boom, boom. All three pieces right there. You moved it up four, you flipped it, and then you made it wider. Okay, one more of these, and then we are almost done. And I'm about out of space, so that's going to make, hopefully, perfect sense here. Okay, this is the letter B. Don't let this letter B bother you. We've got three things happening on this one as well. The first thing I notice right here, I always like to look at the end because for me that's the easiest. That means we moved it up five. We've moved this, instead of having a vertex on the origin, right at the origin, it's going to be up five. One, two, three, four, five, way up here, that's going to be the vertex of this one. Number two, the fact that it has a negative sign right here. This negative tells you that it is a reflection. It means it opens down. We flip this thing upside down, right? Reflection over the x-axis is really what I should say, but I'm not going to write it. I'm just going to save some time. And then here, the fact that this number is not 1, this number is 2, the letter A is 2. When the letter A is bigger than 1, uh, whenever it's an amount with an absolute value greater than 1, it is going to be more narrow. This is going to be narrower. It's going to be a vertical stretch. We're going to make this, we're going to pinch these two sides and pinch them together. Uh, vertical stretch by a factor of 2. I'm going to scoot my phone down so you can see that. So if I had to freehand this, the original one, this one from way up here, this guy right here, would be the basic one that kind of looks like this, right? We've seen it on every single one. The new one, the one that has had three things happen to it, we've moved it up five units. So I put the dot way up here at five. We're going to act like this is five. We've flipped it, so it's going to go down. So I'm going to have these arrows going down in a minute. But it's also been stretched by a factor of two. So this means it's going to be more narrow. It's going to be something like this. 
right? See how the blue lines are much closer together than the two black ones? There's a lot more space between those black lines than there are the blue ones. So we moved it up five places, we flipped it, and then we pinched it together and made it more narrow. That's about as complicated as it'll get today. Okay, the last thing, and this is even easier, the last thing they're going to ask you to do is they're going to give you some equations, and they're going to ask you to find the zeros. Now, we kind of did this in the last chapter whenever we did the zero product property. What does it mean to find the zero? What it means to find the zeros is you're finding the places on a coordinate plane where this graph would touch the x-axis. So zero is the same thing as x-intercepts. Right? Where does this graph touch the x-axis? Now, there are a couple ways to do it. You could make an x and y table. You could pick some easy numbers. You could plug them in, and you could work it out. Like if I put in 1 in here, 1 times 1 is 1, 1 minus 16. We want this number right here in the y column to be 0. If I put 2 up there, 2 squared is 4, 4 minus 16 is negative 12. If I put 3 up there, 3 squared is 9. 9 minus 16 is negative 7. You can see I'm getting closer to 0. If I put 4 in here, 4 squared is 16. 16 minus 16 is 0, right? Oh, so I found it. It's right here. 4, that's one of the answers. But then the other answer you got to figure out as well. And usually if you get 1, the other answer is the opposite of that. So like 4 and negative 4 are probably the answers on this one. But who wants to do this? Who wants to make a chart and just have to guess random numbers until they get the right one? I don't really want to do that. I think there's a much easier way to do it than to just guess and fill out a table. And to be honest, filling out a table takes a long time. Look how you can also do these. You know how in the last chapter we always had to make the equations equal zero? Since this is find the zeros, we're going to replace this letter y or f of x, g of x, whatever I have. We're just going to replace this with a zero, right? If I replace that with a zero, would you know how to solve the problem? Could I just ask you, hey guys, what number would you plug in right here? What number minus 16 would give you zero, right? And if you don't know that in your head, you could do plus 16 on both sides, plus 16 on both sides, and you get this, 16 equals x squared. What number to the second power equals 16? Well, that is the square root of 16. The square root of 16 is 4 and negative 4, right? These usually have two... Uh, roots. So what does that mean? That means this graph touches the x-axis at 4, and it touches the x-axis at negative 4, right? This graph would be something like, something like that, probably, right? It would have two x-intercepts, or two roots, or two zeros. The zeros are the same thing as x-intercepts. If you hear me say roots, root is another synonym. They all mean the same thing. Zero, x-intercept, roots, they're all interchangeable. That means they all have the same definition, right? So all you have to do on these is take your equation. Here, I'm going to spread this one out. Give yourself more room. I'm going to put zero in the spot of the letter Y. Now, this is an easy one. We know this in our head. What number would we put right here to make it 81 minus 81, right? What number squared equals 81? Uh, that's got to be 9, right? 9 and negative 9, because negative 9 times negative 9 is also 81. Um, if you're having a little more trouble, you know what? I need to clear out some space. This is way too sloppy for me. I'm sorry. If you're having some trouble, this isn't making sense. You're like, I have no idea what you're doing here, dude. Okay, rewrite the question. Replace the letter Y or the F of X with a number zero. And then you can solve it, right? So, for example, on this one, if I don't know this one, I can do negative 9, negative 9. I've got negative 9 equals negative x squared. Uh, this is really an imaginary 1 right here. So I could divide by negative 1. I can divide by negative 1, and I get negative 9 divided by negative 1. That's 9. 9 equals x squared. If you're really unsure of yourself, because everyone should know this in their head, the opposite or the inverse of squaring is square root, and so you can say the square root of 9, square root over here, squared and square root knock each other out. What is the, What two numbers multiply themselves together equal 9? 3 and negative 3, right? Because negative 3 times negative 3 is also 9. Right? So there you go. You've got another one. 3 
and negative 3. Um, the next question right here, this is 25. I could do this in the same way. Replace the f of x with a 0 and then solve it like this. Okay, I replace the S f of x with a 0. And I can do minus 25, minus 25. A lot of you can do this in your head, I hope. By the time you get to this point, you see this. You know that this is an imaginary number 1. So then you divide by negative 1. Negative divided by negative is positive. 25 is some number squared. Isn't that 5 and negative 5, right? So this graph would, would have x-intercepts at 5, way out here and at negative 5, and it would probably um, go something like this. Notice how I made this one go down because it had a negative on there. On the first one that I did, I had it go up because it was a positive, right? Uh, two more, and then we will be done. The last two, this one is a little tougher because now you see you've got 2x squared and 3x squared. All these other ones just had 1x squared or negative 1. Don't let it bother you. You're still doing it the same way. If I'm going to do this question, I'm going to put a 0 in the spot of the f of x, and then I have this. Okay, how can I solve that? Okay, go back to what we did way back at the beginning of the year. Plus 32, plus 32, and you get 32 equals 2x squared. And now you can divide everything by 2. 32 divided by 2 is 16, and so we get 16 equals some number squared. We know that should be 4 and negative 4, right? So this one would have x-intercepts at 4 and negative 4. The zeros are at 4 and negative 4, so this one would touch here and here. And then the very, very last one, the grand finale. In the place of the g of x, I'm just going to put a 0. Didn't really give myself a lot of room to do this one, but I'll make it work. Instead of minus 75, I'm going to do plus going to do plus. So that's going to give me 75 equals 3x squared. And I probably know in my head that 75 divided by 3 is the next step. 75 divided by 3 is 25. So what number squared is 25? 5 and negative 5, right? Negative 5 times negative 5 is 25. Positive 5 times positive 5 is 25. And so this one would also have intercepts at 5 and negative 5. So that's how you find the zeros. That's how you find the x-intercepts. That's how you find the roots. Uh, thank you so much for watching. If you're in my Big Ideas Math class, I'm going to post some questions on the website here in a second once this uploads. And I um, hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll catch you all tomorrow. See ya.